from sandeep only yes sir we are live uh thank you sandeep uh good evening everyone uh happy new year to all and also season greetings ipongal lohri and sankranti and uh, everything to all of you and uh, it's great to start this year with the uh, ias academic uh, corner meeting for the month of january and uh, we have uh, uh, two eminent uh, faculty to moderate this session one is deepthi from hyderabad and uh, another our ec dr sunith azra and another tiger from bengal <laughs> thank you sunith and deepthi for accepting and moderating this session and i hand over uh, this uh, uh, meeting to dr deepthi and sunith please take over hi sundar thank you for the invite um, first i would uh, call upon uh, my senior and a good friend and a mentor in a way dr maheshwari who is a knee and shoulder surgery specialist author of essential orthopedics as you all know he is a formal hod and director of uh, orthopedics at max hospital saket formerly an additional professor and uh, orthopedics at uh, aims delhi and is currently the director and gm at gm bw vm sports injury center and uh, at sitaram bhatia hospital delhi so sir i would like you to start your first talk on a unique topic but an interesting one which is uh, tensionable suture anchor technique and philosophy in it thank you very much sir okay thank you adipti and thank you ias for this kind invitation would say not a invitation but just asking me to do this ias is very much my meeting so let me just get my computer okay and uh, can you see my screen now hello can you see the screen yeah we yes sir yes yes need to go on to the uh, right so tensionable suture anchor technology it is something fancy which is the latest kid on the block as far as uh, shoulder surgery is concerned i was introduced to this about a year back and since then i'm quite excited about it so let me share with you what i have understood and where i found it useful compared to what i was doing earlier so let me take you through a quick background of our journey of our journey of using anchors we all started with knotted anchors they were metal biocomposite peak and now the latest is all suture quite a few of us have switched to all suture but they are knotted anchors then came the era in between of knotless anchors because as lazy we surgeons are we don't want to tie knots but for some reason those knotless anchors something like push lock did not take off to my experience they are not very popular at least the glenoid side they are quite useful for the rotator cuff side and those are the suture anchors which are the first generation where you take the suture first put it in the in the anchor and then put the anchor next a little different technique than what we are all used to we are used to putting the anchor first and then taking the tissue bite and then came this third generation what is knotless tensionable anchors where we put the anchor first exactly the way we were putting earlier the anchors and rather than tying knots we had another technology by which we will create a loop and create a tension and tie it nicely without putting the knots and these are the new generation anchors suture tack and fiber tack and i'll tell you about this knotless tensionable anchor technology maybe in the next slide so this is what it is you put the anchor take the bite through the tissue and there is a loop suture which will pull it through across the tissue create a loop and it will go through this inbuilt system what is called chinese knot system and the whole thing is knotted just to repeat there are three uh, sutures one is blue take it through the tissue then through this link suture you just pull it all the way into the suture and there is a knotting mechanism in the suture itself and it can be tied like this so deploy the anchor the way we do always take a bite at the suitable place the way we do always put the suture going through the tissue pull it pull this 
blue, th the other thing, the black thing, and fine tune the tension as the tissue approximates. You can make it tight, you can make it less tight, you can move it more tight as you're comfortable. And finally, the loop cinches and doesn't move. And we know this Chinese technology, that's how it works. The possibility of adjusting tension after all bites have been taken is also there. You can leave those loose uh, threads out. And once you've put all of them, tightened all of them, you can further tighten them one by one if you want to make it very, very secure. So that possibility is there. Even after having done the whole surgery, you can tighten it before you cut it. So first transition uh, in my practice was from knotted to knotless anchor. And there are advantages of knotless anchor. We all know it. Knotted skill is not required. It saves time. Loop security is better. Knot security is not an issue. And there's no condyle damage because there's no hanging knots there. And those are the disadvantages of knotted anchors. We all have been doing it because till now there was no good knotless anchor, at least for the glenoid. So we have all been, you know, doing knotted anchor. Even today, I think most of us still do knotted anchors. And then the literature about knotless and knotted is plenty. At least they show there is no difference between the two. They're as good. If you are quite happy knotting, knot them, no problem. But even if you do the knotless anchor, the results are same. There's no difference in recurrences. There's no result differences. So they're as good, if not better. Of course, lately, then they are coming to be better because they take less time. Obviously, you're not tying knots. So it saves time. And then further down, we know there are problems of knot, not migrates. It can turn towards the cartilage. And then because they're all non-absorbable suture, they can cause knot uh, cartilage abrasions. And in, in, later in life, it can be a problem. Biomechanically, knotless anchors provide better loop security because you're tightened at the And it has been proven that knotted anchor, the knots can loosen up in a period of time. And, it can lose the strength. As a surgeon, what better will I get? No not time, faster work, better lift security, no knot irritation, and I call it balle balle. You know, in Makar Sakranti, it is all balle balle. So first generation knotless anchors, like I talked, was the push lock anchor. This was suture first technique, a little different than what we were used to. So there was a little fixation in your mind how to get to a learning curve. But then suture first technique was described to take the bite in the suture, load the uh, anchor and then put the anchor into the tissue. And while you're doing that, you can do some manipulation. But the fine tuning between tissue bite and the anchor placement was always an issue. For example, if you take a bite somewhere lower down six o'clock and you want to pull this up all the way, sometimes you may find that to get the proper tension, you have to actually put the anchor at two o'clock. And then your last, where do you put other anchors? So that, that mathematics was a little difficult. Then to find a pilot hole, because what you do is you drill the hole, then you put the suture outside, then uh, threads into the suture, then put it back. And sometimes you can't find that hole. It is tricky sometimes. And if you don't put the suture in the proper direction, the, the anchor in the proper direction, at least the bio push locks, it used to break. And you have no control over tension. Once it is gone in, because it is working like a interference a fixation of the suture to the anchor, once it is gone in, you cannot fine tune the tension. So these were the issues why I think uh, the push lock anchor and the anchors of those generation, at least in the glenoid surgery, did not take off, take off. I mean, to my mind, they are not very popular. Then came the second generation, not less anchors, which is what we are talking about today tensionable technology. And this is what it means. So there are two types. One is peak, which is like you put the anchor, solid anchor, exactly the same, but the mechanism of knotting is same. Not less, the same mechanism as I showed in the previous slide. The next generation to that is all suture. We are all, all suture oriented these days. So it was a solid anchor earlier, but now it is all suture anchor, exactly the same mechanism of knot tying which is not tying, but just a tension technology. And there are a number of studies already, biomechanical studies, which show it as a good loop security. It can be done as a horizontal mattress fashion also. And the best was this. The suture slippage occurred only in 11% of the knotless compared to 30% in the knotted constructs in this biomechanical study. So they are good in the sense they have a good loop security. You save time, your slippage is better. 
and all the minus sides of knotted anchors is not there. So this has been done biomedical study on the tensionable sutures. Now, there are different suture configuration you can take, standard ones that we do all the time, one suture, then we can always do mattress. Some of us like doing mattress, even in knotted anchors, it can be done even in knotless anchors. And this is something very fantastic about these suture anchors, what is called interconnected construct. And I will talk to you about this. And this is a lot of very interesting applications. And I will tell you what it means. So let's talk about simple configuration, something like a bank cart repair. And that's a typical case of a bank cart, labrum go there. And that's how it is done. So as you can see, you drill hole. And since they are fiber anchors, uh, you can drill anytime, anywhere. Your card cannula, you have to put the anchor, all these three sutures come out. The one goes through the soft tissues here. And then this is what you do inside. You take the soft tissue anchor through the loop and pull it in, and it cinches like this. You can tighten it as much as you like. This is a very standard, and you can put three of those, and your job is done. This is uh, you have a possibility of fine tuning, and this will show you that. And while you are tightening it, you can tighten it as much as possible. You can actually hold the labrum and pull it up and then tighten it under vision. So you're controlling the positioning and the tightening up. And you can leave all of them independently, don't tighten them, and finally fine tune them. Because once you put one anchor, the other one sometimes becomes loose. So you can actually fine tune tightening even before you cut them. And that is the additional advantage of this. So simple calcification, particularly in slap, I like it. Slap is used to be a very difficult surgery for me because I couldn't see anything. I couldn't see the knots at behind the biceps. I will always more or less do blind knotting. Then I will cut the knot and I know there's a bulky knot sitting behind the biceps and it will be sometime irritating the undersurface of the uh, rotator cuff. And that is very simple with this. Same thing, you put a deploy anchor and it will give you three sutures there. One is a blue one, which is fast. And the same mechanism, you just put a knotless uh, loop and pull it and cut it because now you don't want to see where the knots are. You can just cut it as close as to the tissue. So there's no bulky knot at all. And so doing all this is just one step solution. And it is very interesting to uh, make it very, very simple and there's no bulky knot lying there, which used to be my concern doing slap repairs earlier with knotted anchors. So this is just a small video. I will just cut it short, just show you one, exactly the same way as it is done for the bank cart. And you can put one here and you can put another one on the other side, as many sutures as you like, but it's a simple technology. You can use mattress configuration in case you find the tissue quality is not good. And this is what is very fantastic about this, what is called interconnected suture configuration. Let me explain it to you. So what is done is you put two anchors, all, both of them have the blue suture, blue suture here, and a, you know, this knot, this round uh, knot through which normally we part this through this, we pass it through this and tighten it and a loop forms here. Here, what you do is you pass both together, and you interconnect. That means the blue suture from here coming out of the tissue goes in this knot and the blue suture from here goes through this knot and you form a kind of a bridge there and I'll show you what it means. So these are the two sutures. The blue sutures from this side is going to that loop and from this side the blue suture, so you can imagine once you tighten both of them, this will become a kind of a bridge like this. And once you put them, you pull both of them Rather than making a knot right here, they make a big bridge and this become interconnected suture configuration. Very useful in certain situations and I'll come to you. Remplissage, for example. You know, tying knots in the emphasize was always a very difficult thing to do it blindly. You don't know where the knots are sitting and they're prominent and it's like a blind work. Here it is very simple. You just put those sutures, take them out through one cannula, interchange as I've shown you and just tighten there. And cutting is not an issue because you can blindly cut it as close as possible. So you don't have to actually look inside the subacromial space and it is done very, very predictably. This is one video to demonstrate that. So this is uh, uh, the bank cut, uh, the, the, you know, the hill sex here. And so you clean up the hill sex the way we normally would do if we are doing the amplissage. And through one uh, 7mm cannula, 
which you don't perforate through the posterior capsule, which is here. It is just outside the capsule. You are feeling it. And through that, you introduce one lower anchor first at the lower part there, and then one anchor at the top part. So one lower one is gone there. The top part is being put now. And all these anchors have come out through one carula outside. And now you know what to interchange with what. And as I showed in the pictures earlier, once you start tightening them, it forms a loop, a kind of a bridge here, and it forms a good. So something like this happens. So once you interchange, this happens. And finally, there is a remplissage done with the loop, and you cut them here. There's no anchor. It is all more or less blind, but it works very well. And it is much, much easier to do that way. Outside, as you can see, rather big knots, there is no knot here. It's just a suture. And it is a nice configuration. And it is technically easier to do compared to a normal amplifier that we have been doing. And then you can use the same principle. So you, we all do this technique for bony bank card. And once you put the suture behind the bony bank card, then we have to use something like a push lock. And it is very difficult to push, put a push lock right in the bank in the center of the point. Sometimes when you are banging it, it can break. So this is one anchor behind the bony block of a bank card and one in front and tie them together exactly the same way. And it kind of holds the uh, bony bank, bank card very well and forms a suture bridge kind of a configuration. So that's again. So to conclude, uh, it's a very new thing, but very, very interesting to do it in a knotless way, which we always want to do. But since the previous ones were not so handy, this looks to me very handy. And it gives me a lot of liberty. You can tighten it anytime. And uh, it is very quick. There's no uh, knots inside. And I find it very predictable. I've moved on to this. Since I used it, I have not gone back to anything else but this. And it is a versatile application, particularly in Remplissage, Bony Bank Card. And also now they're coming out with anchors for uh, so I personally find it a very interesting concept and let's hope there are no downside as the literature will come. Maybe we will know what useful it is. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Maheshwari. That was a very elegant uh, technique you had just shown. I remember using this about uh, what 10, 2010, I used to use them when I did my fellowship in Coventry. And they were uh, peak anchors, which had the same technology, where you actually put the suture through it and then tension it. And you could tension it so hard that actually you can lift the patient up when you actually tighten it. That's how strong that the construct used to be. But I have, the, the technology fell off. And now the all suture technique, as you just showed, I've used a few of them. But the main technical tip I would say with these is that you should be sure that there is no entangling of the two bits because once that blue one and the uh, the black one entangle, the tensioning doesn't happen. That's one point. And the second point is I've seen where when you tension it too hard, they have come out of the bone and then you are stuck because you have a suture going through the labrum and you have a whole uh, material, suture material there, which is round, round the uh, labrum, but it's not fixed to bone. So those are the two points which you should be very careful of what I thought. Did you have an experience of any of these pullouts? <laughs> Luckily, not till now. Okay. And uh, I, I think I, I, I'm quite happy with making it reasonably uh, good construct. I'm not, you know, forcing it too much. I know anything can come out. So, but then I can fine tune it. So mm -hmm. I, I, I have not had this maybe over now almost 100 cases. Mm -hmm. I have not had this problem. But for remplissage, it's a very good technique and very elegant way of doing it. I think even bony bank card, I've not tried it, but I think it sounds very easy when compared to the other techniques. But you said uh, that with the peak anchor, it fell out of uh, favor. Why? It was the company is not taking it up, that's all. Because it was an older company which used to do it and no other uh, the later companies do not take it up. That's the reason why it didn't come out to the market, I think. So, okay, okay. Because it never, the peak one never came to Indian market. They were never came to all future straight away. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Can I ask uh, my uh, colleague to introduce the next speaker and go ahead? Can I ask one question? Sure, sir. Yeah, yeah. Sir, Mageshri, sir, I mean, it's a very, you know, interesting and uh, technology, uh, especially when you showed that Rimpli Surge, it was, I mean, as Deepthi said, it was looking very nice. And uh, so is it uh, your uh, 
uh, anchor uh, for everything or just you are using only for like a remplissage or a bony bank or do you use it for all your regular anterior lateral repair also? So all lateral repair by this for sure. I do very few remplissage. I have not only, only done one till now. I'm not a very remplissage fan. So that's it. And slap, I used to actually be scared of doing slap surgery earlier mm -hmm. because I didn't know where to put any, you know, how to see everything. I can't see the anchor, can't see the knot. But, you know, since I've got this, I'm doing more and more slaps. Earlier, I, you know, I never used to believe in slap, but I now do it. That's because <laughs> it is easy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sir. thank you. I think that uh, the, we can now start the next case. I think it was an interesting case uh, as already been shared by, I think it will be presented by Dr. Venu Gopal. So may I request so, Dr. Venu Gopal to start presenting this case? Yes, sir. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. First, uh, I would like to thank uh, IAS and uh, Dr. Sundarajan, sir, for giving me this opportunity to present in this forum. So let's come to the case. So we had a 70 year old male who presented to us uh, uh, with a history of pain and difficulty in moving the right shoulder since last three weeks. He had a history of fall three weeks back, which was associated with the dislocation. The dislocation was reduced in the local hospital. And then uh, now because of the pain and uh, not able to move the shoulder, he presented to us on examination. There was tenderness present, movements were painful. There were no neurological deficits. So we took a plain X-ray. We can see that in the plain X-ray, there is a haziness in the antero-inferior aspect of the glenoid rim. Uh, so we further evaluated this patient with the CT and MRI. We noted that there is a uh, antero-inferior glenoid rim fracture with a bony comminution and displacement of the fractured fragments. So this can be appreciated in the end phase view very well. We can see that there is a, a fragments which are displaced. There's one fragment here and there's one more fragment here. So we calculated the amount of bone loss, uh, which accounted to 30% of the glenoid. Further, MRI revealed supraspinatus and infraspinatus tear, as we can see here in the video. Uh, the supraspinatus is almost uh, 3.5 centimeter retracted and infraspinatus was 3.2 centimeter retracted. Also in the axial cut, we noted there was a upper one third tear of the subscapularis can be appreciated here. The occupancy ratio was 50% uh, for the supraspinatus. Fatty infiltration was grade 1 to 2. So coming to the diagnosis, this is a condition where 70-year-old male is having a comminuted bony bank cut with massive cuff tear. So there are a lot of challenges associated with this with regard to treatment aspect. Uh, one is the age. 70 years with the uh, chances of poor bone quality and poor tissue quality and it is associated with lot of combination there are three fragment as we can see in the ct itself so how to reduce this fragment and how to fix them also it is associated with a massive cuff involving supraspinatus infraspinatus and subscapularis so which position to do for the surgery whether to go for a beach chair position or a lateral position also which technique we should use for the transosseous or whether the transosseous technique or translabral technique or a double road technique for the bank cut repair. So considering all this, this is a very rare situation. So we planned for an arthroscopic bony bank cut repair with cuff repair. So we, we under the general anesthesia, we position the patient in lateral position and then uh, using a standard posterior, posterior portal, we entered the glenohumeral joint, we noted that the biceps was already torn and there was a bony bank cut, as you can appreciate here. There was a small heel sacs defect. We can appreciate the bony bank cut better in this view. So we can see that the labrum is discontinuous. It is displaced along with the three small fragments. There is one fragment here, which is very loose. And there is another fragment here, which is loosely attached. This is the main fragment. So there are mainly three fragments here. So we inserted a, a double loaded anchor at the glenoid rim. 
we did a pilot hole, then inserted an anchor at a four o'clock position. Then retrieved the sutures to the posterior portal. Then we passed a large bore needle through the posterior portal for the transversus repair. We passed this large bore needle through the bone fragments. And then we passed a straight lasso through this large bore needle and then sutures were retrieved through the lasso. As you can see here, we are passing a lasso. The lasso is retrieved. The sutures are fed into the lasso. And then the sutures are retrieved, thus completing the transosseous passage of the suture. Again, this step is repeated for another two sets of sutures. So you can see how the bony fragments are getting reduced to the glenoid. So after that, we tied the knots. Note that slowly the fragments are getting reduced. Sir, sir. So after this, uh, we took uh, another bite through the labrum uh, from the postro superior portal, postro lateral portal. At uh, seven o'clock position, we can see that uh, we are passing a suture passing device. Then lasso is coming out. So this. Come on, man. So this uh, suture at six o'clock position was inserted into the glenoid using a knotless suture anchor. So the important point while putting this anchor is that we should keep appropriate length of the suture tape so that to avoid bunching of the labrum over the glenoid. So main intention of our main intention of us to put this Suture anchor was to reduce the inferior fragment, the smaller lower fragment and to compress. So here we can see after the repair, there are two anchors, one at the four o'clock and one at the six o'clock. So labrum and the fragments are completely reduced. So to summarize the technique of uh, bank arts repair, first we inserted an anchor at four o'clock position, then passed a straight needle through the bone, retrieved the sutures. Then this step is repeated again to complete uh, to complete the repair, the knotting was done, an additional anchor was inserted at seven o'clock position. The repair was completed. So after the bony bank at repair was completed, we moved our scope to the subacromial space. And uh, we found that the cuff was completely retracted up to the glenoid level and the quality was poor. Initially, we tried to oppose. It was not opposing to the footprint. So then uh, we mobilized the cuff. We did a supraglenoid and subacromial release.
the footprint was prepared for uh, subscapularis. And then the subscapularis was repaired using a double loaded anchor. As you can see, and then we repaired supraspinatus and intraspinatus using the uh, double loaded anchors and the medial row, and then augmented with the lateral anchors. So this is after completing the repair. You can see that the repair is stable. There is no impingement on rotations. So coming to the review of literature, this is a very rare case scenario with a 70 year old male having a large bony bank art lesion and a massive cuff repair. So we searched for the literature, but there is very less literature available with this kind of a scenario. So association of a bony bank art and cuff is very rare in younger patients, but there is a 63% chance in the case of patients more than 40 years who are having dislocations. The young and healthy patients do not have a cuff tear because the supraspinatus tendon is very robust and it absorbs a significant amount of energy before the tendon fails. In older patients, both dynamic and static stabilizer fail because of the force, so there will be cuff tear. So there is a note on arthroscopic techniques for bony bank art repair, which is published in uh, August 2022. So in this, they describe three, te three techniques of bony bank art repair. One is labrum alone, another one is transosseous technique and a double row technique. In labrum alone, an anchor is inserted on the glenoid rim and then the sutures are passed at the junction of the labrum and bone. And then the labrum is reduced to the fragment and then it is repaired. In transosseous technique, it is similar to our technique, which I showed. The sutures are passed to the bony fragment and then the knots are tied. So in a double row technique, the sutures are inserted on the glenoid neck. There's a first anchor inserted on the glenoid neck. And additionally, there will be two more sutures. One is inserted at the six o'clock position and another at the three o'clock position. So which is better, whether to go for a single row repair or a double row repair in case of a bony bank art? There are no clinical studies. There is a cadaveric study which suggests that double row repair is superior. There is limited literature available for the bony bank arts as well as massive rotator cuff repair associated with bony bank art. But then whatever the literature available for bony bank art, they talk about small bony bank art lesions and techniques. When it comes to uh, rotator cuff tear associated with bony bank art. There are two articles which are retrospective studies. So one is this study which they have done in 30 cases wherein they have taken cases of bank arts and cuff tear and evaluated the functional outcomes. So they concluded that treatment of both lesions yield good clinical outcome. However, in their study, there were no bony bank arts. There were only soft tissue associated with small size cuff tears. This is another report wherein uh, they have done uh, evaluation of the patients more than 40 years having a concomitant rotator cuff tear and instability. This is also a retrospective study done between 2008 and 2016 in patients more than 40 years. They had four groups of patients, one group of patient having bank art repair alone and another group bony bank art repair and another patients with bony bank art and concomitant rotator cuff repair and another patient with bony bank art repair and concomitant rotator cuff repair. So here we can see that the patients with bony bank art repair and concomitant rotator cuff repair are only 10 in number. So no details is mentioned about amount of bone loss in those 10 patients. And also the involvement of cuff is not mentioned. However, they concluded that bank art repair and bony bank art repair with or without additional rotator cuff repair are effective means to restore functional and achieve, relief, achieve to relieve pain. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Venu Gopal. I think it's a very nice case. I think uh, I have one question. I think it's very difficult to define whether the cuff was there uh, uh, beforehand and the 
only the uh, glenoid fracture has happened this time or not because i think the the irreducibility of the cuff tear initially was probably one of the ideas i mean uh, sign that probably the cuff repair was an old one and the bony bank cut was a recent one how do you decide i mean that uh, whether the one lesion was already there or not I will, uh, uh, Sunit, I will answer, I think. Yes, uh, yes. I didn't care, I think. So, I think uh, that was a free a press I'm case only because uh, he, had a, he was previously completely all right. He was able to lift the shoulder up. He didn't have any shoulder pain. And uh, it, looked, looked, it looked like very massive uh, tear uh, because of the fracture dislocation. And also, the retraction was very huge because it's a three-point phase. Up to the glenoid level, of course, subscap and the supra and the infra. Yeah. The quality of cuff looks like that because of the age. He's 70 years old. That's why the cuff quality is not very good. Otherwise, if it is old, we might have not able to repair the complete, uh, no, you know, we might have not able to do this complete repair of both subscap, supra, and infer. So we felt that it was a new one only because he told it's completely all right. The proximal migration also because of the complete massive tear. Because uh, considering his age and previously he didn't have any pain at all. If it is an old uh, tear, 100% we might have not able to uh, repair the whole thing. I mean, you can say that we can do a partial repair or all those things. No, but you can repair anything, sir. I know that. No, so I don't know. <laughs> not like that, Sunil. No, what I'm saying is, uh, uh, what he showed like is a co poor quality of the yeah, yeah, because yeah. of the age, not because of the uh, durability. Uh, but this could be a factor, isn't it, sir? I mean, the, the, yeah, of course, this absolutely. patient, seventy-year-old, can have a uh, older cuff tear with a presenting with a bank cut. Uh, I mean, dislocation sort of thing, bony bank cut sort of thing. Deep yeah. 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 experience. If you have a like a chronic supraspinatus tear, a well compensated tear, so you will not have any symptoms from it. So when you have an injury like this, they go on to have a and you know decompensated tear. So that means the infraspinatus and the subscapular resource is involved. So then the force couple is altered. So when the force couple is altered, then you get the symptoms. But in this, this is a very unique case that you also have a fracture dislocation in a sense. And that fracture is what you need to fix. And when you fix the fracture, you are obliged to fix the cuff as well, because the stability of the shoulder is maintained from the force couple as well as the static stabilizers, which is the labrum and the glenoid. So you are obliged to fix them. It doesn't matter if it is an acute tear or a non-acute tear. Even a partial repair would be useful in these cases. Yeah. And one more point, I think, sir. I mean, if you are using, I have had a one or two chance of repairing the bony bank art in these older uh, patients. I think the bones are usually very soft. I mean, you can see the already the three fragments were there. So ultimately, even if you are using a I mean, transosseous repair, it ultimately lands up in the labrum repair only the suture actually cuts through the bone and the only the labrum which is actually compressed against the, the grenade. So I think it's a very really difficult situation in this situation to repair the bony bank cuts as well. But the te technique which was shown by Venu was very elegant in the sense that they passed the suture through the bone fragment and got a better bite. Going through the bone fragment and the labrum together would definitely give you a more con stable concept than just the labrum itself. Yeah. But how did you manage, to, for example, it's a young patient, how do you manage to pass that suture passer through the bone fragment? That's the most challenging part of this bony bank cards. Yeah, I mean, I was using the double door technique for quite a long time. Then I saw this publication last year in 2021 in arthroscopic technique. Uh, I prepared for some other talk, then I saw this talk, I mean, technique address I'm not known. Then after that, suddenly I got almost now three or four cases in the last one year. And I felt a very useful technique compared to the double draw because in the double draw, sometimes you don't have a control. It can try to sometimes, you know, lift off the fragment. Uh, the only challenge is, as you said, it is a very difficult to pass the uh, needle from the posterior portal and bringing it down and going into the, this thing is very, very tough situation. But uh, uh, they eventually the needle uh, bent. You know what I mean? It just it hit against your uh, uh, humor, your humeral head, and when it try to push, naturally it gets slightly bent. So the whatever needle which we use, eventually when I when I take it out, it is already bent. So, so it, it goes for the bend. So probably that uh, with the curved ones will be the better one, but but we cannot make a big curved one because you cannot pass it also. So that is also challenging. Maybe around twenty five degrees, like less of what we use. 
that kind of bend which we make a commercially available will be very useful like a banana lasso will be useful will but be useful. you go from the posterior you come out with it so you come out through the capsule again in the front is that I right come, this is anterior fragment coming through the posterior portal and uh, pass through this anterior fragment then the, the needle comes between your fragment and the subscapularis Sub so you clear you clear the area between the subscap and the fracture fragment then you take it through the anterior portal then you exchange your okay. threads okay so it has to come through the capsule in front of the absolutely. Uh, posterior yes, uh, sorry yeah, yeah it has to come out of the capsule okay that's very nice okay thank you uh, sir there are two questions sir from in the chat box yeah uh, uh, Karim, uh, Karim is asking uh, how to deal with uh, rotation while fixing the bony bank cut with uh, suture anchor. Yeah, the, the always when you have the <clears throat> detached to superior labrum, always it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. So when you have a bony bank cut with attachment of both the 6 o'clock and the 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock position, mm -hmm. always it's easy to fix it up because it is not moving around. Like in this case, if you see the superior labrum is completely detached, uh, the 2 o'clock it is only attached to the inferior side. So always it is difficult to uh, control the rotation. So one way is to, you have to hold it with your grasper when you pass your needle at the, as well as when you are reducing and fixing, fixing, fixing the fragment also, you have to control that uh, superior fragment with the capsule, uh, sorry, through the grasper, through the anterior portal to make sure that it is not rotating uh, or it is not uh, overlapping or uh, 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 lifting off. So that is, uh, I know it's technically it's a bit challenging when this uh, bony bank cut, especially when it's uh, detached and displaced. The another question is in double row repair of the bony bank cut, we usually reduce the hinge fragment inferiorly and then we pass the sutures through the middle of the fragment. But in transverse method, it is vice versa. So I think because in this case, you know, once you fix the six o'clock position, you can take a bites, but you should not tie the knot because it, even if it reduces the some gap, the transiasis is difficult to pass the needle. So you need a space, the fragment to freely move to pass the transiasis uh, wires. So what if you want to do, you can do what inferior anchor, you can take the bites and leave it, don't tie the knot. Then we can pass these uh, uh, threads, whatever we showed the transiasis, you can pass the thread uh, 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 by holding that fragment. Because if you fix the six o'clock position, sometimes it can compress, then you will not have a free space for the fragment to move. So transiasis technique is not possible. I think that's it. Uh, two questions in the chat box. We can go ahead with the... Uh, yeah, so one spray. Yeah. Yes, one, please go uh, ahead. Sir, the screen visible, sir? Yes, yes. ma'am. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, uh, Indian Arthroscopic Society and Dr. Sundarajan in uh, giving me the opportunity to present implantless press fit graft fixation at Patela for MPFL reconstruction. This is more of a surgical technique where I would uh, talk briefly about recurrent uh, patella dislocation in the start, where it, this is the most common cause for anterior knee pain in the schedule immature, and uh, it is the second most common cause for traumatic hemarthrosis of knee after an ACL injury, and it um, accounts for about almost 3% of knee injuries, and its incidence is almost 5.8 to 4.9 of a, a lakh population. Uh, incidence is increased in the second decade, and uh, in a general population, females are most common, and in uh, athletic population, the males are twice more common. And stabilizers are static uh, soft tissues are MPFL, MPML, MPTL, and for appropriate length of patella tendon and the middle capsule. Bony coming um, with patella and trochlear group. Dynamic is a VMO. Um, along with the VMO, uh, distant dynamic are uh, uh, IT bands, uh, abductors of the and external rotators of the hip. Bony anatomy at uh, full extension, patella is not in contact with the trochlear groove. And slowly from 0 to 120, different uh, area of patella comes in contact with the femoral trochlear groove. MPFL, it was described by Warren and Marshall in 1979. It is an extra articular and present in the second layer. MPFL helps in guiding the patella into the trochlear groove and it's a primary static restraint to lateral patella dislocation in early flex knee flexion. It is injured in 96% in an acute scenario. Um, attachment of the 
MPFL in the uh, patella is usually at the uh, superior medial to mid part, and it uh, um, it uh, the it uh, constitute with the VMO in the proximal part, and the femur uh, it attaches around uh, 10 mm proximal and 8 mm posterior to the medial epicondyle, and 2 mm anterior and 4 mm distal to adductor to buccal. It's a multifactorial uh, pathophysiology is multifactorial and complex. It is osseous and soft tissue. Classifications are many depending upon the chronicity and uh, presence of uh, ac actual dislocation or anatomic procedure and the uh, and direction of dislocation. Coming to the case, uh, here is a 21 year old male uh, student uh, reported with the anterior knee pain and feeling of uh, giving away. Uh, came with the three episodes of lateral patella dislocation. First episode being 17 months ago with a um, happened during the football tackle and last episode was three months ago. On examination, uh, J sign, apprehension, and uh, quadrant test was positive. Patient had a full range of motion. Uh, on an uh, X-ray, conventional X-ray was within normal limits. On MRI, we I, I, uh, we saw a high-grade MP filter at the patella, and the patient has had a digital type 1 trochlear morphology. Insal salivity was around uh, at uh, 0.9, and cation dissonance was 1, which, was, which suggested that patient did not have a patella alta. TTT ratio taken in MRI was uh, found to be 11 mm. Uh, cut, proposed cutoff value is on an MRI was uh, is supposed to be 13 mm. Treatment according to this treatment algorithm, I uh, went ahead with the operative treatment because patient had three more than three dislocations. It is uh, found out that surgical treatment is uh, better and more superior than uh, conservative for a recurrent dislocation. According to this updated uh, guidelines by Dijor, uh, our patient uh, had uh, Dijor type, type A and uh, but no patella alta, so I went ahead with the isolated MPFL reconstruction. So this is the animated uh, video where first a uh, uh, 2.5 mm guide wire was passed from medial to lateral, almost 5 mm distal to the insertion of the vastus medialis and followed by the second guide wire the distance from the uh, uh, parallel to the first one and the distance from the first and the second was around 15 mm. Uh, then followed by uh, 4.5 mm uh, cannulated rib bit was overdrilled for a depth of 15 mm. And then uh, eth uh, uh, number one ethylon or a ethibon was passed through the eyelet where one proximal was uh, proximal was with the loop end and uh, distal was with the free end and past uh, the bead pin was retrieved to the lateral. This can be vice versa also alternate. doesn't matter if uh, the distal uh, was, uh, the distal had a loop and the proximal had a free end. And the uh, free end was passed at the loop end on the proximal and the free end on the proximal and medial aspect was pulled. So by the end of this uh, step, we had a single Number one, ethylon passed from the distal medial, went uh, roundabout on the lateral, and uh, the proximal had a free end. To this, uh, to this, I passed um, a two different colored opposed uh, uh, number two fiber wire, and proximal uh, free end of uh, ethylon was pulled, so that by the end of uh, this step, we had a two unopposed uh, different colored fiber wire on proximal and in the distal. To this, a central part of gracilis tendon, which was harvested, was placed through the loop and uh, the and one free end was pulled and alternatively the other free end was pulled. And later, both the free end of the um, alternative color of wire was pulled so that the graft is seated with the press fit like a socket technique. So coming to the uh, surgical video where first a diagnostic arthroscopy was uh, done to rule out any intraarticular pathologies or uh, any loose bodies. Then the graft was, graft or gracilis graft was harvested and prepared. So followed by uh, uh, almost two centimeters uh, incision was placed on the medial aspect of the patella and uh, tissues, retinocular tissues were cleared. And using a uh, using a nibbler and periosteum and a nibbler, a groove was created on the medial aspect of the patella, 
and as shown in the video two parallel k wires uh, two parallel uh, 2.5 mm guide wires was passed from medial to lateral uh, in this step you can play uh, you can make a nick on the lateral side so there is no tissue irritation or you can make a high higher high anterolateral portal and to and uh, for this scanlated 4.5 mm drill was done for a depth of 15 mm and as you can see here the this is on the head end side and this is on the foot end side here this is the medial and lateral here we had uh, two ethylon loops where one was a free end other was loop end and this on the lateral side other was free end and other was the loop end here the free end was passed to the loop end and the distal end of the free ethylon was pulled so by in this step we'll have a loop end a single wire which is a u shaped where a loop end is present on the proximal and a free end is present on the distal and to this a uh, two different color opposed fiber wire is passed and the fiber wire is retrieved slowly instead of a uh, ethylon even of uh, ethy bond number two ethy bond also can be used here need to be careful and by the end of this step we have two different color unopposed fiber wire one free end and one other loop end and here we had a blue loop end and a white free end followed by here uh, using now the femur a femur is prepared using the radiological shuttle point as a reference and a 6 a 6 mm can uh, drill is drilled and prepared and here a track is prepared in extra articularly between the second and the third layer which can be con uh, confirmed arthroscopically and here the central uh, here the central part of uh, the gracilis tendon is passed into the loop and here it is made sure that the central uh, central part of the gracilis is sat directly on the groove which is prepared and making sure that there is no v shape rather than we we need to have a more of a fan shape and here alternatively free end of either uh, distal and proximal fiber wire is pulled and last step here we need to pull the each fiber wire so that the graft goes in and sits like a press fit socket here you can see here the graft has gone in and sat and uh, this step is done so that there is no suture loosening and the uh, uh, free end of the graft is prepared and this is passed through the the track which is made and passed in the femoral tunnel and uh, femoral tunnel and the graft is secured with a uh, 7 mm interference screw and later this can be observed arthroscopically as a new acl recon uh, mcl mpfl reconstruction rehabilitation and in long knee extension brace is given for 4 weeks and patient is uh, allowed to uh, put full weight after 4 weeks knee flexion is 30 degrees for the first 2 weeks 60 degrees for the third week and full range for the from the fourth week onwards quadriceps uh, exercise post op immediately uh, muscle strengthening is started from the seventh week and return to sports by fifth month this is ongoing case study where we have uh, i have already a case study of uh, eight cases all are recurrent the uh, lateral patellar dislocation four equal male and female and three patients uh, had associated pathology of uh, two patients had uh, dijord uh, type a morph uh, trochlear morphology and the one patient had a 1.3 patella alta advantage of this technique this is a uh, anatomical double bundle fixation it uh, gives us a press fit socket type of fixation and it is a implantless at the patella avoiding uh, related complications and it is a low cost it has a because of the groove uh, made it has a better graft healing and less chance of patella fracture possible complications is uh, suture loosening irritation of the lateral patella due to entrapment of the soft tissue and improper tunneling and take home message for this is we need a for any mpfl reconstruction we need a meticulous clinical and radiological assessment to individualize the patient key to a good reconstruction is a uh, restore anatomy maintain isometry and to avoid any over treating of the graft there is no conclusive evidence of a superiority of one particular surgical technique 
uh, any milder degree of associated pathology can be addressed by isolated MPFL reconstruction alone. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a nice technique. I think uh, I think majority of us now agree, Sundar sir. I mean that uh, the less the implant on the patella, better it is for the MPFL because you want uh, the patella to protect the patella. I think the fr patella fracture is one of the major complications of um, putting too much implants in the patella, isn't it? Uh, Sumant, can you unshare your screen, Sumant? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very important because it's very nice technique, uh, Sumanth. First of all, uh, uh, very nice technique and a very good uh, demo by Sumanth. Thank you, sir. Uh, um, I think, yeah, I think it's very good uh, technique, uh, especially when you have a uh, small bones, especially females and uh, uh, younger females. I think the techniques will be very, very useful. So even I don't use any tunneling and putting a soil lock uh, anymore. If at all I use, I use... Uh, the same kind of technique, but I don't use this uh, loop technique, but I use the like uh, uh, one all suture anchor or a uh, 2.8 uh, or maximum 2 to 2.5 There is a small anchors so that we can avoid the uh, no risk for uh, stress uh, to the patella. Otherwise, I, I mean, I also try to avoid the bigger screws and big grabs, big tunnels in the yeah. patella. So any any incidents, um, sir? Have you seen any uh, patella fracture as as such? I haven't seen any, but I never read about it. Yeah, it's only a yeah. Of course, literature report, case reports are there in patella fractures. Uh, actually, in fact, uh, before we uh, tend to do these anchors, no, I even I used to make a four point five tunnels or five mm tunnels to loop mm -hmm. around. Both I used to do even a vertical tunnel, big vertical tunnel. But I in that uh, risk factor is less when you make a vertical tunnel, but that was not very not anatomical actually. Yeah. The fractures were reported when they make a two transverse tunnel yeah. uh, with 4.5 or a 5 mm reamer. So I think uh, maybe that was all uh, early weight bearing, early mobilization. That could be the reason for the that kind of case reports. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Say, I mean. I mean, uh, what is yeah. what could be a reason, Suman, for using uh, I mean knee brace for four weeks? So what was the worry actually? Uh, sir, no, this is the protocol which used for MPFL in general. So, because this is an ongoing study, we would like to brace them for uh, four, three to four weeks. So three weeks is ideal. Okay. So, your experience in, in same? Uh, you use four weeks of uh, knee brace for this uh, recurrent dislocation? Uh, for the patella? Yeah. No, no, but I will give for the pain comfort for at least two weeks' time, but we'll make them weight bearing walking. Yeah. Um, because basically, this you don't need an immobilizer for a recurrent patella dislocation. So, mainly for the swelling and pain purpose. Yeah, yeah that's that. maybe yeah. for seven days, 10 days maximum. Yeah. Isn't it? For two weeks, yes. It's maximum. Because your fixation is stable, you can mobilize the knee also quickly. Yeah. Weight bearing also can be done. Mm. Exactly. I think uh, uh, if any other questions from anyone, uh, Ramakan? No, sir. No questions, sir. Okay. Uh, that means we are well on time, exactly 9 o'clock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Mageshwari, sir, uh, Venu, Sumanth. And thank also, you. I want to thank Diti and uh, Sunit for uh, moderating this session. Uh, have a great weekend. Thank, thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, very nice case, sir. sir. Thank you, Eddie. Thank, Thank you. you. Good Thank night. You. Good night. Good night, Diti. Thank you.